All right. Good morning. Open your Bibles up to uh, Colossians chapter 3, if you would. We are uh, continuing on in our series, Holy, Holy Different, where we're discussing being otherly different than the rest of the world. Uh, The series, we'll give it a sec, sensitivity. Ah, that's better. All right. Thanks, Stacey. Um, So we're discussing this issue of being wholly, wholly different. Uh, Kind of the sermon series as we've been focusing on on our lives is to say that Christians ought to be different in some serious way, a noticeable way, a way that outsiders look in and see us and think, you people are weird, but weird in the right ways. And so as we gathered together in our first week, we talked about being obviously joyful, that it, one of the thing, first things you should notice about a Christian is that they have this deep-seated gladness of within, a gladness of the spirit that emerges no matter what else is going on in life. Um, obvious joy. Our second week when we got together, we talked about abundant pity. And we said that a Christian needs to treat everyone else uh, that they encounter, whether those people are in the church or outside of those church, whether those people are friends or enemies. We need to treat those people with pity, a strong desire for them to experience good in this life, a compassion for people that looks at human beings and thinks God loves them and then begins to emulate that in our own person. Ob- obvious joy, abundant pity. Uh, week three, Matthew talked to us about transforming truth, that a Christian needs to treasure truth, and people from the out- outside should notice that you as a believer value what is true, that you esteem it highly, and that you are very careful to make sure that you're only believing and only speaking that which is true. Uh, then we talked about being strangely selfless. A Christian should not be concerned for self all the time. One of the messages, the central messages of the gospel is that God is taking care of everything that is here, that my eternity is lined out with him. And knowing that that's the case, we have been afforded the opportunity to turn our eyes outward, begin looking at other human beings and thinking, what can I do in order to build them up and draw them into this amazing relationship with our God? Then Ken spoke last week about having all the wrong priorities. And this is one of those features, again, that should be recognized by the outside world. They should look at us and think, you are different. You think differently. It's like you want different things out of life. It's like you don't care about the same things that most of the rest of the world cares about. This should be obvious to those who witness and experience us. Today, we're going to talk about being perpetually worshipful, perpetually worshipful. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, our Master, Our Father, you have loved us with a great love. And Lord, you've afforded us the opportunity to turn our eyes to you each and every day, each and every moment of every day, to be in your presence, to experience you, and to have a relationship with you. Lord, to be engaged in a worship experience every moment. God, I pray that after today's discussion, we would settle for nothing less during the whole course of our lives. Lord, help us to be attentive right now. I pray that we would be mindful of your word. Uh, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak through me uh, to convey exactly what you want. Lord, that I would speak only the things that you want to be heard. We love you, God. It is in your most precious name we pray. Amen. Have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 3. Some years back when I was in college, right before I started here at Northern Hills, I was at Miami University. And... uh, I was in the philosophy department. I was taking a capstone course at Miami, at, which is a, like the, the last course you have to take in a department where they go, okay, you're okay to graduate. Uh, the capstone course was in philosophy, and we were discussing um, trust, the issue of trust. It was an entire semester where we just studied the idea of trust. During the course of that semester, I made a lot of friends in the class, um, but there was one day when I was speaking, and I expressed something about my relationship with God and talked about the nature of being a Christian. and one person who had been very friendly with me throughout the whole course up to that point was staring at me in a way that made me know I had crossed a line. Something was wrong. He was looking at me as though I had seven heads. And I I left class that day, and I was walking down the stairs, and he said, you're really a Christian? And I said, yeah. And he went, and then left. The next day, I saw him on campus. I was walking across campus, and I said, Hey, Rich, how's it going? And he drew back like he was about to punch me in the face. And I I just looked at him and went, whoa, 
I'm not Amish. Uh, that would be a bad idea. And I'm, I'm, fortunately, fortunately, he didn't actually hit me, but I, I had that moment where I went, what exactly do I believe Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek, and how am I going to apply this? Fortunately, I didn't have to, have to determine that in the moment, but there was just this loathing, this hatred, and I walked away from that going, how did two months in the, of this class go by without this guy recognizing that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ? How did that happen? So I want you to be reflective for just a second. I want you to ask yourself, how many people in your sphere of influence do you know that don't know you're a Christian? How many people do you experience in your workplace that have no idea that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? How many people do you know in your family that don't know you follow Christ? How many friends do you have where you're afraid to mention anything about this or let this be aired? Colossians chapter 3. Paul addresses the church, and he says this. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let peace of, the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him, to God the Father. Is this a good expression of what your life looks like to those who are outside of Christ or maybe to those who are in Christ who spend time with you? Do they look at you and do they see you charging one another in the name of Jesus Christ? Do they see you praising God with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Do they see thankfulness in your every moment and every action? Or do you keep it really well hidden? Let's begin our discussion today by talking about the worship-free Christian. The worship-free Christian, the believer who does not engage in worship. I want to first of all begin this section by addressing the issue of what is worship. What is worship? Well, most of us, when we hear the word worship, think immediately, well, worship is a religious engagement, right? That's when people gather in uncomfortable circumstances, uncomfortable settings, um, to engage in bizarre activities. I, I've seen it happen. I know what that looks like, right? That's what, that's what worship is. Our word worship actually derives from an old English word, virtship, which means worthiness or meritousness, which I must add is a difficult word to say. Merit, meritousness. Try it. You guys are better than I am. All right. Worthiness or meritousness, it is, it is giving God a, well, the recognition he deserves. That's what the word means. Uh, we might also describe worship this way, reverent love or devotion accorded a deity or accorded an idol or sacred object. Ceremonies, prayers, or other religious forms by which this love is expressed. Ardent devotion and adoration. This is what worship is all about, right? Well, when we're setting out to actually look at how the scriptures translate the word worship, what we find is if, if we were to take the Old Testament and New Testament words for worship and translate them as literally as we possibly could, we'd arrive with phrases like this, to bow down before, or to kiss toward. Uh, one word that we have for worship means agreement. In other words, God says something and I agree with him, and that is worship. It means assent or to acknowledge who God is. Okay? to ascribe worth or value. We just talked about that at the front of the service. Um, so is worship, is it merely a religious experience? Well, the answer should be obviously no. In fact, it's a human experience. Every human being engages in worship to some level or another. The term idols should have clued you in when we mentioned that earlier. What is an idol? An idol is something which, does, which gets your honor and your devotion or your love. Could be an actual thing, could be a person. Um, it is a human engagement. Those outside of the church have their objects of devotion too, don't they? You ever watch the sports endeavor and just like you, you see people who are just maniacs? Maybe some of you are those people, right? Uh, but I, I always think of these guys like out in the middle of winter at football games with their shirts off and like painting on themselves and stuff. It's like, how devoted do you have to be in order to do that, 
How much devotion exists in order to bring you to this point where you're like, I will freeze myself to death so that the camera will point at me for two seconds, and that's how I can express my love for my team. Things like sports, things like, I don't know, Oprah, um, careers, legacy, politics, wealth, prosperity, your own kids. There's a lot of things that people are devoted to, right? So it's not merely a religious engagement, it's a human engagement. But more than that, it's an innate desire that we all have as human beings. Famed atheist Daniel Dennett, um, after having a near-death experience, Daniel Dennett is a uh, philosopher. Um, he had a near-death experience due to a heart condition. And uh, one of the questions that came to him in the aftermath of it was this, Dan, did this make you question your atheism? His response was, yes, I did have an epiphany. I saw with greater clarity than ever before in my life that when I say thank goodness, this is not a mere euphemism for thank God. We atheists don't believe that there is any God. I really do mean thank goodness. There's a lot of goodness in the world and more goodness every day. And this fantastic human-made fabric of excellence is genuinely responsible for the fact that I am alive today. It is a worthy recipient of the gratitude I feel today, and I want to celebrate that fact here and now. In other words, there is no God, but I have this urgent need within me to give gratitude to something. And so what do I give my gratitude to? Well, I thank goodness. Human beings want to thank. We want to express gratitude. We want to express adoration. Did anybody see the sunrise this morning? It was a, it was a beautiful one this morning. It was really beautiful. And I can't help but see something like that. Immediately, devotion to God just emerges naturally and unbidden. Just this, Master, you are awesome. And I hope that you have that experience. Many people in the world have that same experience, but they've got nothing to direct it to because who on earth would be out there? Worship is not just a Christian experience, not just a religious experience. It's a human experience, and it's a human experience that is innate in every human being. So let's think about how our culture addresses worship. And here I'm addressing our culture, kind of America, but also Christian culture. What we act like worship is. What we act like worship is. Well, for many of us, when we hear the term worship, we think of a song service, right? Right? Yeah? I hope that as we gather every Sunday, we are engaging our hearts and our spirits that we're readying ourselves to come before the Lord in spirit and in truth. I hope that that's the case. I hope that our time together is a, a, a radical bout of honoring God. I hope that that is the case. But if we believe that that's all that worship is, we're falling desperately short of doing what it is God has called us to in the experience of worship. It is not merely a song service. Um, again, if that's your your thoughts about what this is, read the New Testament. Does it look like they're only experiencing God in a form of worship on a Sunday morning or on a Saturday or on a Friday? No. Worship is something that is taking place all the time. As Jesus walked from place to place, moment by moment, in deserts and good circumstances and bad circumstances, worship is emanating from him and from his followers. Worship is not merely a song service. Some of us think that worship is just feeding God's ego. Now, we wouldn't say that out loud typically. But there's, some, there's part of us that goes, look, we've, we've got this God, and for some reason or another, he needs to hear us tell him how good he is. He's, he's up there just like, you know, this teenage girl that needs a compliment and, and is just begging for it with all that he has, and he won't be satisfied until we say nice things about him. We better say nice things about him. Well, is that the way God is? Does God just want our recognition? Is God just kind of some ego freak? I hope you realize the answer to that is no. God does not need to be told how good he is. God possesses what we call omniscience, all-knowing, which means God knows how good he is. He doesn't need our reminders. So why would he possibly want for us to worship him day by day, week by week, moment by moment? Any of you guys have the original Nintendo Entertainment System? Anybody? Okay, couple, some, some people might still have it. The original Nintendo Entertainment System had a power button, and then right next to the power button had a reset button. And we all knew where that was. 
because you'd start playing a game and things would start going south and it's just going terribly wrong and you always know I've got the reset button and so you just, boom, hit that button and, and things are starting over. Okay, clean slate, let's get going again. Worship is that. All right, your life, my life gets mucked up by the world so much during the week. We start seeing things through the long, wrong lenses. We start thinking the wrong thoughts. And God has basically given us this, these moments, these times in life where we hit the reset button. We see God. We can understand who he is. And suddenly everything else becomes clear. God loves us and cares about us, about us and gives us these moments. It is so that we can have a relationship with him, but there is a definite um, benefit to any human being who does worship on a day-by-day basis. Amen? So it's not merely a song surface. It's not feeding God's ego. Um, many people think that worship is a private matter, or at least it ought to be a private matter. Note that how a person interacts with God is often frowned upon um, by when made publicly visible. Think about Daniel in this regard. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament? When Daniel prayed, where did he go to pray? Yeah, right in his window in a very public setting. And he would bow down and worship the Lord, and people were unnerved and irritated by that. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your own life, um, but when you make clear that you have a relationship with God, many people recognize that they don't. When you make clear that you have knowledge of things unseen or that you believe in things unseen, many people have big questions that emerge in their lives and it makes them uncomfortable. And so rather than look at themselves and think, is there something wrong? Sometimes they externalize and they look at you and they think there's something wrong and they don't want it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to experience it. Somebody who genuinely loves God in public uh, is a threat to a lot of people. Uh, there is a pressure to keep your religion private. It, it comes from all over our world community. There are a lot of people who do not want your relationship with God projected on any level. Keep your religion to yourself. Keep it out of life, public life. Keep it out of policy and politics. Keep your religion hidden. And sometimes that pressure actually comes from people within the church. Why? Because they're made uncomfortable by the fact that you're being a Christian openly. They're made uncomfortable by the fact that you're expressing your love from God because, again, there might be a a kind of indictment there that says, maybe I should be doing this as well. And so, have you ever heard of the term crabs in a bucket? You never have to put a lid on on a bucket of crabs so long as you have more than one. You know why? Because every time one starts climbing up to get out, the others grab it and drag it back down, keep it at level. And sometimes this is what transpires within the church. When somebody is acting good and godly, a lot of people treat them like they're weird. Or we look at somebody and may say, maybe that person is supposed to be a minister. Or maybe that person is supposed to go into full-time ministry because that's a super Christian. When maybe it's just a Christian. And we're not quite living up to that standard. It's not merely a song service. It's not stroking God's ego. It is not meant to be a private matter. Some of us approach it as though it's a burden. Um, and I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing if we were honest, some people approached church this morning going, Ugh, again today, maybe I'll just sit in the lobby and drink coffee and, and talk to my friends or, or something like that, along that, that line. Uh, unfortunately, worship sometimes turns into a have to for many people. It's not a get to. It's a have to. Um. I was singing a song at CIY when I was a teenager. I was at the Christ and Youth Conference, so imagine like 16-year-old Ben Walker. I'm standing there, like long hair down to the middle of my back and earrings and stuff. Yeah, hair. A lot of hair. No, not here. Here. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm singing, and, uh, and I, we were singing this song, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. You know the song, right? And as you're singing it, how many of you, honestly, have thought, Good grief, how long are we going to sing this song? Any, is that just me? Come on, honestly. No? Okay. Well, as we're singing that song, and we're like 15 verses in, and I could sing of your love forever, I could sing of your love forever, my youth minister looks over at me and he goes, could you though? Could you really sing of his love forever? And then he just went back right back to singing. And I was like, 
ow. Like, like immediately that got me thinking about what I was doing there. And so many times we're in a song service and we're saying things that we totally don't mean. And in this instance, I'm going, I'm listening to the song. I'm thinking, what a burden, what a drag. Come on, let's move on to the next song. Nice when, nice when things kind of hit you and you're like, oh, I could be doing this much better. Um, worship is not meant to be a burden. Worship is meant to be an experience that completely unburdens us in so many ways. That as we come into the presence of God, as we see who he is, we begin to look at our problems and our circumstances and recognize he's got control. God is at the helm. This is all going to be okay. Is it a burden? Eh, it shouldn't be. Most of us, though, will agree that worship is weird and awkward. Um, I remember being a teenager and thinking, one of my biggest fears was that some of my friends from school would come into our worship services at church, and they would sing, see what we were doing and go, what kind of weird cult are you in? Uh, we, had, we had the worship team at that stage of the game had these microphones that looked like um, Price is Right microphones, real long ones. And they would hold them all the way down at the base, and they would, you know, they were all standing up in front, and they'd hold their elbows up, and they'd sing, and they're always looking around, making eye contact with everybody the whole time. I'm like, this is so weird. Like, you <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. And, and it, was, it, was just this, it was just this really awkward experience, but, uh, you know, Christians, we're exceptionally good at being weird. And sometimes we don't realize how weird we are because we don't see ourselves from outside of ourselves. But most of us do look at worship, and on some level, especially if you're new to Christ, you might think, this is a little bizarre. That's okay. It's all right that it's a little bit bizarre. You know what? It should feel a little foreign. It should feel a little different. It should feel holy. It should feel separate. What about a Christian without worship? We've suggested that maybe there could be a Christian devoid of worship. Is that possible? I want to suggest to you that it is not. So if you're a Christian and you do not engage in worship as your daily experience, I'm just going to ask you very, very passionately to give serious analysis to who you are and what you really think. Being a Christian without worship is like being a fish outside of water. It is unnatural and it is unhealthy. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what comes naturally to you should be worshipful thoughts and worshipful experiences throughout your day. Honor, uh, honoring God, adoring God throughout your day. To not have that is unhealthy. It would not be right for your spiritual life if that were not the case. Imagine a husband and wife, and you meet them, and, and as you're talking to them, like, they, just, they don't look at each other, and they don't laugh together, they're, they're, they're not friends on any level. It's like they don't talk. They don't experience each other. They're not even acknowledging that one another exists. If you met a couple like that, you would probably walk away thinking to yourself, what kind of atrocious relationship do these people have? And this is exactly the perception we give to the outside world so much of the time. They look at us as believers. They're looking for some relationship that we have with God, and they're not seeing it. They're not seeing in a relationship. I mean, we might talk about love to them, but we're not expressing love to him. We might talk about devotion on the outside, but they don't see any devotion in our lives. It's not right. It's terribly, terribly wrong. Let's move on to talk about genuine obstacles to worship. I want you to recognize from our first section that if you're a believer, worship needs to be manifestly present in your life. It needs to be evident. Secondly, obstacles to worship. Um, we have a lot of problems in trying to come into relationship with God. And one of, the, one of the processes of being a believer is we need to look at ourselves and see what are the obstacles that are holding us back from greater relationship with the Lord. One of the big problems is that we, as a culture, worship stuff. And let me say it's stuff in the sense here, um, by stuff I mean that which is not God. What kinds of things are you devoted for, to? Let me list a few options for you just to get the wheels rolling. Um, your house? How devoted to, to your house are you? Your car? A car that is not your car, but you wish were your car. Your kids? Your spouse? Your legacy? Your sports? Your sports? 
your music, your food, your games, your entertainment, your political figures, your political positions, your music, your knowledge, social media, famous people, your friends, the opinions of your friends. What things are you chasing right now? What is on your list to acquire? What are the things we worship? What would a song service look like in this congregation if every time we got up to sing, just imagine this, there were a phantasmal image of what we were thinking about in front of us that everybody else could see. So just this ghostly image of whatever was on our minds as we sang. For many of us, standing to sing would be like, and he's worshiping the Frisch's breakfast buffet, right? Or, or, or how many of us would have that image of our bed, like, left unmade, just, you know, oh, like I could be sleeping, right? Sometimes uh, if, if you could have and be projecting such an image, I think we would be far more embarrassed about what's on our minds. Um, sometimes even sinful things occurring during, our, during a worship service. I don't know if you've ever been mindful of that happening with yourself. What are the things we worship? What are the things we devote ourselves to and think about? Um, the problem is not just that we're distracted from God, but often we've altered God to sort of match our impression of who God ought to be. God imp- approves of my taste. God approves of my opinions. He likes all the stuff I like. That's how I know he's God. I'm so good and so perfect that I can see his reflection in me. Now, you would never, again, say things that way, but I want you to think about this for just a moment. It is scary, it is frightening, it is terrifying to interact with the God of this universe. It should be on some level. When you come into the presence of God, are you not just a little bit terrified? Do you think to yourself, just for a moment, perhaps, perhaps my Heavenly Father's values don't match my own? Maybe he wants me to change something about me. Do you show up here on a Sunday morning going, Lord, I'm ready. Go ahead and cleanse me. Scrub something else off. I need to be different. Or do you come in here just expecting God to reflect all of your immediate values? Worship should be a scary experience. If it's not, maybe you're not worshiping God. There should be some level of terror as we approach the Lord just going, I know who this is. I mean, think about that. The God who crafted the heavens and the earth, the God who instated all things, who holds all of history and knows the end from the beginning, that God is the one you're approaching. And he says that as we sing and as we speak to him, so long as we are in his good graces, that his attention is on us. That God is looking at you right now and seeing what you're doing with what we're saying. Is that not a little scary? We worship our stuff. Um, we also have a problem with worshiping self. And here I don't mean literally that you're like bowing before the mirror. I hope you're not doing that. It would be weird. Uh, worship, uh, worshiping self, I hear, uh, when I say this, I am meaning worship that is self-seeking or self-serving or serves some other interest. So let me ask a question in this regard. How strongly does your personal preference impact your worship? How strongly does your personal preference impact your experience of worship? Music styles? Do you not like what you hear all the time? I'm not worshiping on this song. They should do a heavy metal version of this. Visual preferences? Um, There might be somebody out there who's like, he's not wearing shoes again. I actually did not know I wasn't wearing shoes until I started thinking about using that illustration. And then I looked down. Um, sometimes there are things that just disturb the visual, and we, we oh, I can't focus, can't focus now. He's, he's got that slide up there. It says Burger King, I'm thinking about Burger King. Um, how about the right mood? I'll only worship when I'm in the right mood for it. Um, a couple weeks ago, I told you this psalm where David starts out the psalm, and he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Do you remember this? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's commanding himself to bless God. He's like, I don't care what else is going on. You bless the Lord right now. You give him glory. And some of us, as we gather together every Sunday, need to be doing that. And throughout the week, need to be doing that. We need to look at ourselves and go, bless the Lord, soul. I'm telling you what to do. You give God the glory that he is due. Personal preferences can mess things up for us. Um, 
I know that some of us come into worship services and we think circumstances must please me if God wants me to please him. And again, you'd never say that out loud, but that's the way we approach things sometimes. We also have some other subtle corruptions of our worship in this regard, uh, geared toward the self, self self-seeking, self-serving, or serving some other purpose. So let me just suggest a few of them to you. Um, Information gathering is not worship. Information gathering is not worship. You might be surprised to hear me say this. After all, if you've been here for a while, you know how much I emphasize the mind life and how I I discuss worshiping the Lord with all your mind. But our worship time is not merely a glorified Bible study. It's not a matter of just getting more information and sticking it in my head. Imagine if somebody asked me about my love for my wife and I just began rattling off data. Well, she was born on this date, and she she grew up here, and she was raised in this fashion. She went to school here. Would you go, man, that guy really loves his wife? Or would you think, Wow, that guy might just be a stalker. Maybe he's, not, maybe he's not married to her at all. Love, true love, true adoration should contain information. It should have information. It should seek information, but it is not limited to information. I'm saying this because this is a condemnation on myself sometimes. Sometimes I substitute more knowledge for more worship, and it's not the same thing. I can't merely love someone through the, the, the vehicle of information gathering. I love someone because I have a relationship with that someone. Does that make sense? The worship is not merely information gathering. Warren Wearsby was talking about it in one of his sermons. He was talking about how preaching should be, and he said it this way. There is much more to preaching than passing along religious information. It must reveal not mere facts about God, but it must reveal the person of God. And that is who we are looking for as we engage in worship. Worship is not mere information gathering. Worship is not feeling. Feeling is not equitable to worship. Our culture is really messed up in this regard right now. Many of us go to worship services thinking, make me feel something. If I feel something, then it was a good worship service. If I don't feel anything, then it was a bad worship service. Oh, the Holy Spirit wasn't there today. Really? all based on how you feel as a falling out from the service. I feel bad for those who actually lead musical worship. Um, for many people, they go into a service and they are just looking for uh, you know, this, this shiver experience during a worship setting. That does not indicate whether or not you've been in the presence of God and dealing rightly in worship with God. That is not an indicator of that. Worship is not mere feeling. Worship is not the means to another end. And here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes in the church, um, individuals form up an approach to worship with secondary motives. Motives like producing a good show. We want everything on, on stage to go smoothly and perfectly because then people will know we care and that will be worship. This is not the way it's portrayed in the New Testament. Sometimes we look at worship as a form of evangelism. Now, many of you are probably thinking, Ben, you've been saying the whole time that people should be able to see us worship. Yes, but that's not the goal of worshiping. The goal of worshiping is not just so that I can bring other people into relationship with God. The goal of worshiping is so that I can relate to God. They might see me in the context of that, and they might be drawn toward God as well. But the goal is God and you. Make sense? Um, Sometimes we worship because we're looking for an answered prayer or an uplifting feeling. These are secondary motives. They're not the purpose of worship. They might be a byproduct of worship, and oftentimes they are, but that's not the goal of worship. Sometimes we engage in worship by worshiping the otherly. The otherly. What do we mean by that? Um, Ken mentioned in his sermon last week those who really work hard to be spiritual. If, If you're listening to this on audio, I'm making air quotes. Spiritual. There are a lot of people, in fact, everybody you encounter probably wants to consider themselves a spiritual person. And what do they mean by that? Oftentimes they mean they worship vague things or they have vague ideas of themselves as somewhat superior to all other people. Think about that. I'm spiritual. I'm somewhat better than the average person you meet. That's what's being said, right? I'm, I'm, there's something within me. I've got this deep, vague, kind of interesting nature that makes me better than everyone who's around me, or at least better than the average person. I'm spiritual. 
Um, we try to fool ourselves into thinking that we're in touch with some greater thing, a thing which is there if I need it, but does not require anything of me. And there are a lot of people who pursue life like this. Um, you know, <laughs> I buy essential oils. I eat only organic food. I, you know, I, I, uh, I light these certain kind of aromatherapy candles. I have crystals involved in my life. I'm a spiritual person. No, you just bought a bunch of stuff. That doesn't make you spiritual. That doesn't make you godly in any sense. Many times um, we don't just worship the vague, though. We worship a sensation. Um, I, I love the phrase, the Holy Ghost heebie-jeebies. All right? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is exactly what we were talking about just a moment ago, this idea that we're just trying to have this certain feeling in the presence of God, the Holy Ghost heebie-jeebies. We just want something exciting and interesting to happen or some exciting feeling to occur. This is not the goal of worship. That, that is a chasing after the otherly. I want some experience, but I don't necessarily want that experience with God. Ideally, we are worshiping the one true and living God. This is where we'll be spending the rest of our sermon time today. And some of you are like, the rest? We're still going? Yeah, still going for a little while. All right, um, I want to talk about pursuing the one true living God, worshiping God and what that looks like. The life of worship. Let me give you just some practical ways that we can implement some of this stuff today so that we can make some of these things happen um, with our lives this week. Firstly, recognize God. Recognize. What does it mean to recognize someone? What does it mean to recognize someone? Well, that's basically, you think about it, I know who you are. I know who you are. I see or appreciate what you've done. That is recognition. Does that make sense? I know who you are and I see what you've done. Can you do that with regard to God this week? I know who you are. I have seen what you are doing. Let me give you a couple ways to do this. Number one, mindfulness. Mindfulness. To be mindful just means you're actually thinking in the moment. You're actually thinking about what's transpiring. Ascribe honor to God in the moment. The best illustration I have of this, there was this, uh, this monk named Brother Lawrence. And the guy, I, I, some of you guys have probably heard of this guy before. Brother Lawrence, uh, he was in a monastery, and he was like a dishwasher and a cook. Like, just kind of a nobody. But people started coming to the monastery and seeking out Brother Lawrence. Can I please talk to the dishwasher? I'd like to see the cook, please. We've got priests who are here. Yeah, but I want to talk to the cook. And the reason is, is because this guy had a relationship with God, which was unlike any of his peers. It got to the point where bishops were coming from distant realms to actually come talk to this guy and go, what is your secret? Like, how is it that you're relating to God on the level you do? Uh, if you want to read about Brother Lawrence, there's a book called Practicing the Presence of God, which is just a collection of a lot of his sayings. But Brother Lawrence said things like this, I have abandoned all particular forms of devotion, all prayer techniques. My only prayer practice is attention. I carry on a habitual, silent, and secret conversation with God that fills me with overwhelming joy. You guys have internal monologue? Anybody have internal monologue? Just me? Are you serious? Okay. I, I talk to myself about things all the time. If I'm in the car, sometimes I'll do that out loud, which makes me look crazy. I know that. Can I suggest, take your internal monologue this week, convert it into an internal dialogue. Instead of talking to yourself, just start conversing with God about what's going on. It doesn't have to be all the time, but just as you're going through your day, start talking to God a little bit about what's transpiring. Mindfulness of God. Brother Lawrence says this, the most holy and important practice in the spiritual life is the presence of God. That is, every moment to take great pleasure that God is with you. Understand, God spoke about it this way, that when we were his and he is ours, that he comes to reside within us, that he mingles and meets with us, even to the point of mingling with us in our own minds. So we engage in mindfulness of God. We can also engage in meditation. Meditation is different than mindfulness in this sense. Meditation is thinking about things past or things that have occurred, right? So mindfulness is being aware of what's going on. Meditation is being aware of what has transpired. So a couple methods for meditation on God this, this coming week. Reflect on simple things that are going on in your life. Reflect on the, the things that have brought you to where you are right now. So many of us never take the time to assess how we arrived where we are today. 
Ask God to show you your story this week. Start looking back and reflecting on your life and see how God has forged you, sometimes through like serious trial and fire, into the person you are today. Think about how different things would be if it was all smooth running. If God hadn't made you trip that one time or let you fall into the ditch and then come back out. Your testimony, understanding where you have been, will give you a great indication of how involved God is in in your life. Amen? Um, Beyond mere meditation, meditation is a wonderful thing. And I I should say this, meditation can be on little things as well. Um, For instance, I have a meditation at least four or five times a week where I take that first sip of coffee in the morning and I go, Lord, what a wonderful thing you've done. And I'm serious. It, it's, I, I'm not kidding about that. Like, I really have this kind of moment of, of worshipful experience when I take that first sip of coffee in the morning. Uh, Brother Lawrence said something similar to this. He said, it's not necessary to have great things to do in life. I turn my little omelet in the pan for love of God. Love that. Just in the mundane, the small things, I'm expressing my love for God, and that can be an expression of my love for God. Examine the flow of your life. Examine the flow of human history, particularly of the Scriptures. The more you study the word, and and again, I'm not saying that worship is limited to study of the word, but worship should include study of the word. If you know what God has done, you have great insight as to what God is doing. So meditate. Uh, We need spectacles and hearing horns. Not literally. That would be a very funny cult. Uh, Spectacles and hearing horns. Uh, We're dull. We're dull of wits. If we are not careful, we tend to not pay attention to the most important things happening. And so I would encourage you this week, begin practicing to see and hear God. Allow yourself to be amazed by God. Tune in and start seeing his mighty work, his mighty truths. Uh, My brother had a friend named Daryl. African-American gentleman worked in the machine shop with him, and Daryl had a uh, portion of the machine shop that uh, was engaged in finished grinding. He was a machinist. Um, And so uh, Daryl had church every day. And this guy was just worshiping the Lord constantly. My brother said I would go talk to him sometimes. And as we're talking, my brother said, I'd start sharing what God was doing in my life, what God was teaching me. And Daryl would just go, look at God. I love that. Like, look at God. Look at how God is training you and teaching you. Look at God. Can you start seeing your circumstances that week and start saying to yourself, look at God. He's active. He is engaged. Will I be engaged with him? We engage in recognition of God. That is the first thing. Recognize God. I know who you are. I see what you're doing. Secondly, we engage with conversation and conversation with God. We call this what? Prayer. Okay, good. Glad we knew that. Prayer. Conversation with God. Talking with God. Uh, Now, I should say at the outset, I'm saying talking with, not talking to. Talking to means that's a one-sided thing. Uh, Imagine getting a phone call and you pick up and somebody's like, Hey, uh, I need uh, groceries. Go get me some milk. And, uh, and um, if you could get me a girlfriend, that would be great. Click. And, and essentially, that's what happens a lot of times with us and God, though, right? I mean, you, you just kind of dial them up, and it's like, here's what I need to make my life perfect. Bye. Conversation with God. If you're going to hear from God, that means you need to know the Scripture again. That also means you need to participate with the people of God, and you need to hear the Word of the Lord regularly. That also means you need to meditate on God and understand who he is and what he's done. That's part of hearing from God. Conversation. What kinds of things should we talk to God about? Can I suggest a few things for you today? How about prayers of confusion? Ever prayed this? Lord, I have no idea what you're doing. Does God want to hear that? Yes. I think God loves it when we look at him and go, I don't understand what's going on. Prayers of confusion. Prayers of communion. God, I recognize that you are with me right now. These are simple little prayers, people, but do you think these radically alter how you feel and think? How you interact with God? I know you're with me now. Prayers of confession. Lord, I repent of what I've done or what I've left undone. Prayers for guidance. Lord, bring me your wisdom. Prayers for gratitude. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you are doing. Prayers of joy. My God has a plan and I'm part of it. Prayers of truth. Lord, you are creator. You made this world with us in mind. You gave us free will to defy you or to choose you. Lord, you've been long-suffering. Lord, you are compassionate. Lord, you showed up. You lived with us. You taught us. You died at our hands to redeem us. Lord, you gave the blind sight. 
You set the prisoners free. You covered us in your blood and renewed us with your grace. You gave us a mission. You gave us meaning. You give us joy, fellowship, a place at your table, and you are preparing a place for these wayward sons and daughters. Can you think of a few more truths? They're innumerable. When you start thinking about who God is and what God has done, you could just rattle these off forever. And he needs you to recognize them. He needs for you, and you need for you to recognize them and to say them. Prayers for the finish line are another good one. Come, Lord Jesus. Occasionally, you need to look at the world and you need to go, this is not my home. This is not the end of the road. I know there's a finish line and I know what comes next. Come, Lord Jesus. We are waiting. Pray, talk with God. <clears throat> Recognition and communication. Thirdly, let me suggest this this week. Engage in expression. What is in me needs to come out of me. What is within me, what is filling up my heart, had better be overflowing. Um, there are scripture passages that say things like, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, there's, a, there's this nice Hindu proverb that says this, uh, what your heart is full of will spill out when you are bumped. When you're bumped this week, what is spilling out of you? Is it worship? Is it praise to God? Or is it things that God would be dramatically ashamed of? Get public with your faith. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, You are the light of Christ to the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds, your moral excellence, recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You get it? Jesus is like, look, we don't light a lamp so that we can, like, hide it and keep all that light hidden. That's not why people light a lamp. Do you know why people light a lamp? To fill a room with light, not just so that people can see the light, but so that people can see everything else by the light. God is giving us the opportunity to, to put this light on display. He's like, look, you're like a city on a hill. You can't hide that. If you are filled up with me and my love, that is going to spill out. That's going to become public. And that's the way it's meant to be. Talk worshipfully about your God with other Christians. Make this a practice. Does your family hear you talk about the Lord and about what God's teaching you? What about the other believers in your workplace? Man, they need to. The New Testament uses um, a word to de define worship oftentimes, and that word um, essentially is the word communion or Eucharist, the idea that we are actually communing with God. Here's what it means. Eat food together. The earliest church, what it did on a regular basis is they got together and ate. You know why? Because God's good. And God desired that Christians would engage in an act of worship called fellowship. That as we gather together, that suddenly God is manifestly present in a powerful way, and that would be a light to the world. When two Christians get together in their workplace, everybody around should be like, what's that? I want to get into that. What is happening with these people? There should be something that transpires there that draws people in. Um, as I was getting this message together, uh, I was at a McDonald's. Um, my coffee shop was closed, the coffee shop I had been doing work at. And by the way, just to clarify, some people were like, you got a job at a coffee shop? No. I meant that I work from a coffee shop, not that I work in a coffee sh you know. Okay. Um, that was shut down, so I went to McDonald's, and I'm working at McDonald's, and as I'm sitting there typing, and I'm like, you know, express your Christianity in public so that people can hear it. This McDonald's in Landon is full of, like, all these old retirees. They just go hang out, and they just talk all morning. It's a big old hen house full of old men. Uh, and so they're all talking the whole time I'm there, and, and I'm, I'm hearing these guys, like, you know, they're talking about baseball and about what's going on with baseball. You know, a couple of guys were like, you know, I, I stopped paying for cigarettes back when they reached this price. Well, you remember how much a White Castle was? Oh, my word, we used to eat so many White Castles. So they're going on about all this stuff, and then suddenly I hear a word, and I tune in immediately, Jesus. And I turn around, and I'm just, like, looking at these guys as they're sitting across the table from each other, and they were just two of the retirees, and, and the guy was like, but I know, I know with all my heart, that the moment I am dead, I'm going to be with Christ. I just think about the thief on the cross. 
and about his last words as, as he's going, when Jesus looks at him and says, today you will be with me in paradise, I know that once that moment comes, I'm going to be with him. And as I listened to it, I went, yes, this is what's supposed to be happening all the time. People in this world should not be able to get away from that. I think that's God's design. If you wonder why Christian fellowship might be perceived as a kind of worship, consider how your parent, you as a parent would feel if you saw your kids hanging out with one another and loving on one another. That joy, that wellness, that contentedness that you would experience as you saw that happen with your kids, I think God experiences that when he sees us with one another. Pray together publicly. Share your joys and experiences with other believers. Share God's truth with one another. Let unbelievers hear you worship and acknowledge God in your speaking. I want to just, you know, let me back up and make mention of this. Jesus said that where two or three gather in his name, remember this? I'm right there in the middle. Where two or three gather in my name, I am with there. I'm there in their midst. Think about what this means. I don't think he's just using flowery language here. I think what he's doing is actually saying there's a spiritual reality that you might not be witnessing, but it happens every time you get together. When you see another believer and you start engaging on the things of God, think about who is between the two of you or the three of you. That the Lord God is right there in the midst. He is right there with you. And you are engaging in an act of worship as you fellowship and share God's love with one another and with him. All right, next, in closing out, I'm sorry, I know we're going a little long. Let unbelievers hear you worship and acknowledge God in your speaking. Do people around you know that you're a Christian? If so, how? Consider Daniel. Here's a very practical way. Bow your head to pray before you eat. Um, I, our, our, some of our kids who are at the, the Little Miami School District um, make it a habit, I, as I understand it, to get around the lunch table every day at school and then all bow their heads and one of them will pray out loud as a group. Oh, I love that. You know who else does? Almighty God. Um, there's something to be said about being public with your faith. Now, again, this kind of flies in the face of what a lot of our culture says. I know that's the case. God wanted it that way. It's going to make people uncomfortable. Why would you want them to be comfortable? If somebody's going to hell, if somebody's got eternal separation from God, why would you want them to feel okay with that? It's not God's desire that we let everybody just feel okay and we just hold their hands and walk them to the gates of hell and say, I hope you were comfortable in this life. It's not right. That's not love. That's not compassion. It certainly isn't worshipful. That same Daryl that I mentioned earlier, uh, I said that the portion of his shop that he dwelt in, they called it, they called it Daryl's church. He worked there and everybody knew Daryl had church every day and everybody heard it. And he was the object of a lot of ridicule in that shop. Um, there were people who ripped him up one side and down the other. There were people who loathed him. They went out of their way at one stage of the game to uh, pass a hat around in the shop and take up a collection for Daryl's church. And not everybody hated Daryl. A lot of people loved Daryl. But the people who did not believe, again, for them, Daryl's life was a sort of indictment. And so my brother asked me, he said, Daryl, what did you ever do with that collection? He goes, I kept it. Gift of God, I suppose, <laughs> right? Sometimes if you're being ridiculed, if you're being mocked for your love of God, that's a good thing. It, it's it's kind of, it, you might think, man, this is hurtful or this is painful. I don't like it when people don't like me. But ask yourself this, on a deeper level, does it feel right? Does it feel right to be expressing love for God and to be treated poorly by the world? I think you'll recognize it does. So in conclusion, we discuss recognizing God as worship, communicating with God as worship, expressing outwardly our devotion to him as worship. What starts as an unnatural discipline, and I'm telling you this, this week, if you put this into practice, this will feel very unnatural. What starts out as an unnatural discipline can become your natural motor, modus operandi. It can become the way you normally function. I recognize that a lot of this feels weird but I think it should feel right. As you practice, there are going to be folks who avoid you. There will be others who will be drawn to you. 
Some people will mock you, others will be cheered and encouraged by you, but all, all, all will begin, begin seeing you as you see God. Worship, worship, be holy, wholly different. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for being patient with us and for letting us come to you and for letting us stay away from you so that when we come back to you and come back to you in strength, it can be that much more powerful. Um, God, I pray this week and every week from here on out that our lives would be ones of worship, that we would be giving you glory and honor each and every moment of every day, recognizing you, communicating with you, and expressing that recognition and that communication. Lord, we don't want to be hidden Christians. You've called us to so much more. You've called us to worship. You've called us to engage you. Let everyone see it. It's in your most precious name we pray, Father. Amen.